Now you can leave it there. Okay, as you can see, there's, we're having a little technical um, issues with the pointer, but there's three types of DNA. Autosomal line family tree DNA is called family finder. Microchondrial DNA is also on family tree DNA. And Kathleen Brandt did talk about that a little bit. We'll get into that. It's called mtDNA. Y chromosome is the male um, chromosome that only males have. And that is called the Y DNA. And there's a variety of levels of tests. And there's the interesting X. Can you move your mic? Because it really has good sound. Is that better? Oh, yeah. Good. Um, what is the likelihood of non paternal advance or false paternity? And everyone that takes a DNA test needs to be aware that that is always a possibility. Uh, this was posted uh, 2013 on Family Tree DNA um, site. We believe that the rate of unannounced adoption or false paternity is about 1% to 3% per generation and compounds each generation. So we like to think that our paper tree is 100% accurate, but without DNA proving it, that doesn't make it so. When confirming your lineage, we recommend that you test yourself and your oldest member on each branch of your tree. That is extremely important because that allows you to go back another generation. So that would be like your sixth generation if you test a parent or an aunt or an uncle. That's another generation from you. Okay, there, family tree DNA has uh, everything you need to know about DNA. And... Okay, can you hear me? I guess I have to hold my head still. That's the problem. <laughs> I, I like to move a lot, so pardon me. So family tree DNA has a huge learning center and all of this is just for signing on. It's freely available. You can get information about glossaries, beginner guides, family tree DNA user guides, expert handbooks, group administrations, maternal line testing, paternal line testing, autosomal, and FTDNA user guide, and webinars, all free for you to just go to their site and start looking and clicking and learning. That's always something that you should consider before you test. All right, so after you've read through the paper uh, that they've offered you and learned about it, then you order a test. It, it talks about shipping and handling, troubleshooting, family tree DNA process. It gives you an idea of what you're going through, going to go through, count settings, interpret your results, group projects, and your privacy. So everything is there for you to learn. All right. I love this chart because it really shows you how your um, your DNA is shared with ancestors. Think of it as a Y. Everything on the uh, right side as we're looking at it is gonna be your Y DNA. And everything on the left side is gonna be your MT DNA, your mitochondrial DNA. Everything in between is your autosomal. So it's going to be selected matches within that group. You'll also notice that, and this is just a, an example of how autosomal DNA gets passed down. You can see like the grandfather, you have two blues, a short blue, then it doesn't all the way get through because then you pick up the yellow, then you go down another generation and it just keeps on going. So. DNA, your autosomal DNA gets mixed constantly. It will constantly get mixed. All right, um, so autosomal DNA equals 22 chromosomes. 
The 23rd chromosome is your sex chromosome. Everyone, both biological males and females inherit a random mix. That's kind of what I was showing by that graph. 50% comes from your father and 50% from your mother. Where everybody gets confused a bit, they say, okay, I should match all my siblings the same because we each got 50%. So to give you some idea how that doesn't always work, your parent, including you, but your parent is equal to 7,000 centimorgans that are used for testing. You get 50% of that. That's going to be 35 centimorgans, 3,500 centimorgans. That is what is used to match you with different uh, cousins. Now, out of that other 50%, you could potentially have a sibling that would get the other 50%. So it may look like you just got matching on your mom's side only. So you have to be careful of assumptions. You have to utilize several techniques before you can actually make that decision. Here's a good chart that kind of gives you an idea. Gives you an idea of what you want to look at. Think about the blocks as being the first generation. Minimum, this is where you have a child and parent match, going to be about 3,000 to 3,500 centimorgans. The next down is a full sibling. You're going to share somewhere between 2,200 and 3,000. Then a niece or nephew, you can see it goes down a little bit more and it keeps on continuing down. So it's important when you work in your DNA that you have a chart like this. It's important that you understand what you're looking at. Blaine Bittinger put together this chart and it's a real quick way of looking at how you match somebody. So you pop in, and this is a free tool that anyone could get on their thing. You just type in, a shared cinema organ project and it pops up a little a thing that you can put in the amount of DNA and it gives you a potential relationship. So as you can see, it also has the range of potential cinema organs. And you can kind of see that that would be, um, you know, how you could define half relationships, siblings, full and third, fourth and fifth cousins. This is another thing that's important for you to um, kind of grasp when you're doing DNA. And that is how you're related to someone. You have your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, and great-great-grandparents. Well, obviously, more than likely, you're not gonna find that on your DNA magic, but you're gonna have cousins. So how are they related? So I love this because if you're looking at great-grandparents, you can see that there's going to be second cousins, second cousins once removed. It's going to be dependent on that generation level. If you look to the far left, you have the person, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Gives you an idea of how you're related. Another chart I like to have handy when I work in my DNA. All right, so let's take a look at this. This is an actual um, slot, um, uh, photograph of one of my matches that I work with. You can see how you can sort your matches. You can see what the range is on that. And then you can also look at what the shared DNA centimorgans are gonna be. Now, you'll see that there's a variety of potentials. So what does that mean? You have a half sibling, uncle, niece, or nephew that's going to share somewhere between 1744. Now, I had to do the research before I could find that it was a niece. And, and those are the tools that you can use relationship ranges, shared DNA, longest block, X DNA, Y DNA, MT DNA, and most recent matches. I like to think of family tree DNA as a place to do research. They're the most involved with all aspects of your DNA. 
You will not find another company like this. This is another tool on uh, this is another tool on family tree DNA. It's it's the matrix of DNA. And what it is, if you take a look, that first name on the left hand side matches two people on the list. But then the next one down doesn't match anyone. So I would pull that one out of the matrix. But look what I have. In the bottom part, you can see that there's that that I, this is myself, the Flanagan, it's at the end. I match all of those folks. But not these these folks don't match all of my matches. So it's a clue on how to determine how you're matched together. Okay, so the Y chromosome. I feel like I'm losing the, the <laughs> microphone here. So you guys can still hear me. Or is it bad? If I talk quietly. Sure. No, you can't hear me. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So the Y DNA um, carries. Uh, the Y-DNA uh, comes down and is something that a male receives from his father. He receives the X chromosome from his mother. Just a minute. This is just not working where I got it. I'll try. It's picking up, you know, when I move. <laughs> okay, let's try it. Let's try it this again. Are you okay hearing me? Okay, good. Okay, so the male gets the X from his father, but get, I mean, pardon me, gets the Y from his father and the X from the mother. Both of those are tools to find how you're related to other generations. Men only inherit that father's Y chromosome. So a woman never gets that. A woman is going to get an X from her father and an X from her mother. One of the things, one of the things you'll see on Y DNA. Gotta make sure it's close. One of the things you will see on Y DNA is that it will try to grade that Y DNA about age wise. So you'll have BCE or BC. We recognize BC as before Christ, but genealogists do not use that term. BCE started about 575 years after the BC was being used. It's just a numbering system to give you some kind of time frame. You'll need a chart like this when you work your Y DNA. And you can see at a 36, 37 marker uh, at four generations, you only have a chance of 59% if you have one difference. At 37, you should have zero to be a really good match. 67 marker, you can see at four generations, it's only 71% accurate with one uh, genetic difference. This is the haplogroup migrating route that was on my uncle's uh, Y DNA. As you can see, he's the blue line. His haplogroup started somewhere in Iran and moves up through the towns uh, and the countries that where his actual ancestor originated sometime in um, about uh, 400, 500 BCE uh, in Austria. So this is another way of looking at that same information. So you can see that Y31615 uh, started somewhere around 400 CE. And my uncle's 
because he was tested in 2000-ish. You can see he's down at there. At this point, there's no branches coming off of his Y DNA. And that was a very um, interesting um, thing that I learned about his Y DNA. But you can also see from that Y31615, other branches have come off of that. So all this says is that somewhere around 400 CE that my uncle and these other testers shared a common ancestor. This is another way to look at it. My uncle is the 31616. And you can see that his grouping comes from the FT472818, the IBY48168. And their parent group is hidden by our black bar there. But you can see that the countries, as far as what people are claiming, are basically going to be either um, Ireland, North Ireland, British, USA. This is a haplogroup story that you get with, you get, this is a haplogroup story you get with uh, family tree DNA. This is not something I put together. This is what they gave me. They also give you notable connections. Who does this Y DNA match with? So there you can see a few names. Then it gets to the ancient relatives in the direct Y DNA. And it shows you that my uncle goes back to what's called General Scott 24. So who is this man? He lives somewhere between 1445 and 1268 BCE. And it gave some areas where you could probably find males today that have that testing uh, haplogroup. This is another thing that uh, what, uh, family tree DNA does is gives you suggested projects. You have the, the IM223, that is his main haplogroup before we did the uh, Y500. These are little snippets out of that that I could join. The North of Ireland, which is all of these are public groups. Ulster Heritage, Ireland Y DNA, and then the one to a haplogroup. This is what you get. A lot of people are always afraid of doing their Y DNA, but it's just numbers. And what these numbers tell you is that at this particular marker, the DYS393, there were 15 repeats. Now keep that in mind. Okay. If you look at this chart, what they're trying to do is to see how many numbers are the same. So if you take a look at that S393 and follow it down, you can see that 13 and 14 in that line, and then there's a 12. The 13 and 14 is called one genetic difference. The one that is 12 is going to be two genetic differences from the the ones that the people that have the 14 then you total up the line as you go through that is your genetic difference with your matches this is another way that you can look with the inf look at the information look at the inf look at the can you hear me looks at the information of the Y DNA. Um, it gives you um, like a snippet, A1207. Okay, go ahead. And it broke this down for me. So you see that A1207? It's, it's, 
Okay, so this this is the um, breakdown of that one little snippet, and it shows you that it was T A T T T T, and you can see all the way down that it repeated itself. This is what a project looks like um, on Family Tree DNA. This is a public um, family tree with the Mayflower Society. Um, these are some of the male passengers on the Mayflower. Some of you may recognize their surname. These are male descendants that have been proven to be uh, Mayflower descendants and they have tested their Y. When, whoops, hit the wrong one. Okay, you can see that the RM269 is pretty common. And so without testing to Y700, there's really no additional information that can be held. But when you get down here, they have tested at 700 and you can see they have a unique haplogroup. So if you are a, a male, Descend it from one of these surnames and you test your Y DNA at 700, you should be able to match your Y DNA if it is a direct male to male line going back to one of the male Mayflower passages. Microchondrial DNA is very interesting in that it can be used in a variety of ways. Um, I tested for the first time uh, on 23andMe and it gives you the breakdown and mine is H1A1, that's all I knew. Um, I didn't know how to use it, so I studied it. And then I decided to test on family tree DNA. So my microchondrial DNA became H1A1B, and that was giving me the HBR1, HBR2, and the coding region. Okay, my coding region brought back to Ireland, England, Denmark, Scotland. So I have a variety of testers that have that same haplogroup. And here again, you have, whoops, did that again, have the percents of folks that have tested. Now, does this mean a whole lot? No. This does. It gives you an idea that the full sequence is what I recommend if you're going to do this, that you do. Uh, it's 50% accurate at 125 years. And it's 95% confidence at 22 generations or 550 years. Now, thinking about that. Okay, this is um, a chart for my uncle. And he's an H9. It gives a description of where the haplogroup has been. Uh, what I can learn about, whoops, did it again. Uh, I did with the um, mutations and what I can do with the differences and coding region references. This is going to be able to give us a good look of how to compare against somebody else that has tested their microchondrial DNA. These are the matches on the world map that match me on my microchondrial. And you can see I have 29 uh, matches. This is what the X chromosome looks like. And I want to get have you get a feel for this. Um, just to look at that, what we this is my X chromosome. So looking at that, knowing what I told you, that a female gets an X from their dad and an X from their mom, who do you think I'm matching there? Any ideas? Well, in this case, this is my paternal sister. 
we both got an X from our dad. Now we would have got a full line. So you can see that I didn't get the same part of that X that she did. So she got a little more or a little less. This is a first cousin, a paternal first cousin. Her father was a brother to my dad, my biological dad. And so you can see that we share X because she would have got, her, her dad would have got the X from his mom who happens to be our grandmother. And my dad would have got the X from his mother who would be our grandmother. So that makes us related, but we can prove it by the X. This is the female inheritance chart for the X. Everything in pink means that that's an ancestor that you can get an X from. This is for a female. This is the X chromosome inheritance for the female. So you can see that the female gets two Xs, one X from their mother, one X from their father. And this is a direct X coming down to the son. Now, the grandmother gets an X from her father and mother, and it gets recombination here before passing it down in one strip. So basically when you use the X and you're using it for a male, not a female, you can use that X to take you back only on the female line of that paternal male. This is a male, female, male, female, female because remember a male cannot pass an x to a male okay that's kind of a difficult concept and i'd be love to answer a question if i didn't say it correctly for you to okay yes yeah my my mother has huge dystrophy which is a genetic disease very specific past to uh only pass in the female so it'd be only passing the one on the Y. Yes. X. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to relate how all this, how that would go where you have 50 50 chance of it actually being on the X that goes to the uh, sister. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So if you are, let's say this is your mom. Okay. All right, she would have got an X from her father and an X from her mother. And from what you're telling me is that that disease is passed only by the X or the mitochondrial or the X. There's, it's my it's the X. It's the X, okay. So technically a female could get an X um, that was passed down to this female from all of the greens. So it could come from any of those ancestors. So um, it's a little easier on a male. This is a male inheritance. So you can see that the male gets his ex from, her, from his mother and then she gets it from her dad and her mother. And then this is the male, he only gets it from his mother. So you can see if you would get a chart like this and write the names of your ancestors in here, you will be able to say with certainty where the X is coming from. So that would help you. All right, so. I would say that almost everybody gets into DNA for ethnicity. Um, and family tree DNA has a unique way of displaying their ethnicity. Um, it's, there's, they use, they have a 90 uh, reference population that they use for ethnicity. The more, the better. And you will see clusters highlighted, major events, genetic, um, events, thus shedding the light on the complexity 
of how our DNA is inherited. For example, um, back in about early 1700s, there was a major uh, shift in uh, weather and they call it the season of no spring or summer. They lost crops, they couldn't grow crops. So those kind of events can affect your DNA. So you can look for those kinds of historical data through different databases to see how it does um, affect your DNA. So this again is my uncle's uh, mtDNA. And it really, our primary, his ethnicity. So remember the Y DNA uh, had his Y -D DNA coming up through uh, Syria, Turkey, up into United Kingdom. So his female haplogroup is showing that potentially the route might have been similar. So all we really can say with certainty is 100% Europe at this point in time. Yes. And on on Family Tree DNA, do you looking at the website? They have several different kinds of tests. So can you talk a little bit about which, if we which test you would recommend for which purpose? Or okay, what do you want to find out? Well, if for example, if if, if this is your main area of interest, which of the DNA tests would be best for for ethnicity? For ethnicity, twenty three and Me. Okay. What would be the best test then for uh, each district? For what? For the disease that's inherited by the uh, You know, uh, 23 and me, 23 and a wood company does the best for uh, disease tracking. 23 and me has spent their time doing research on disease. Um, I'm not sure that the disease you're talking about is one that they've tested for, but you could go online and check that out. So they do most researches on disease. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so you can see that, um, you know, we have quite a bit of interlap among the countries. So when people kind of go with the idea, like I'm all Irish, no, you got to know where did the Irish come from? They just didn't show up in Ireland and that's where they were. This is what family treaty DNA does with the ethnicity background. And I do like this um, really quite well. I showed you just a few chromosomes and the color is Western Europe. And then it breaks, it doesn't break down the uh, Wales, Scotland and England. Then it has the Southern Europe. It tells me what chromosomes they're on. How can I use this? Very easily because I can go to the chromosome browser, see who matches me on those chromosome areas with my uncle. And I can make a pretty good educated guess that our shared ancestor came from that region. And, and you can break that down a little more. It gives you an actual uh, address for a chromosome 12 where this Eastern Europe is um, from. And it says how much organs, and it tells me where it started and where it ended. This is critical information when you go build out a DNA tree. So DNA is your story and what you choose to do with it is really up to you. There's all kinds of things you can do. You can find new cousins, break down brick walls, um, share your family history. But I'm going to say that you need to read the privacy statement of any company that you go through. It's important for you to know what they represent and whether it's something you're comfortable with. Okay, now I'll take some questions. Yes. Uh, I wasn't sure that I clearly understood what you were talking about when you talked about weather events. The uh, no spring, no summer led to. Um, crop failures, so it oh, impacts your DNA? It does, yeah. Um, you know, it's a serious issues with health um, that happens to somebody 
um, say, for example, cancer. Um, cancer does affect your DNA. Uh, if you have undergone cancer treatment, you should not do DNA testing because it, it does change your DNA. Uh, you might want to check with a doctor, like maybe five years after your cancer treatment, and see if the DNA has recovered. Sometimes it doesn't. So that's important to understand. Um, stem, cell, me, stem cell transplants for people that have cancer, where they actually take the blood of somebody else and you know, put it through a filter and give it to somebody dealing with cancer. Um, if it's a female to a male, uh, if you go test that person's um, sex chromosomes, he's going to have the, the, uh, the um, sex of a female because that's what happens with when you take all of the blood out and you put something else in, it re replicates to what that person was. So it's important to understand that health, uh, environment all affects our DNA. Okay. Any other questions? That I can answer? Yes. Well, I have the celiac disease. Uh, and I, it took 10 years to figure out what was wrong with me. I don't know who I got it from, but I have passed it on to all three of my children, two boys and one girl. And then I have passed it, my son passed it on to two of his three children. How is that passed or? Okay, I would truly suggest 23andMe um, because they do they do have a research project on celiac disease. Oh, really? Yeah, they do. I do know that for sure. Okay. Any other questions? I apologize for the technical issues. I am a mover, obviously, and it's really hard to stand still, and I'm going to have to work on that. This is the hardest one of my presentations, believe it or not. And I did it uh, at the, yes, it is the hardest because family tree DNA covers everything. And the projects that they have, if you do your Y DNA or your MT DNA, you definitely want to get into projects. Um, there are people that are managing those projects that are extremely knowledgeable. And they can really help you understand your Y DNA and your mitochondrial DNA in a way that I can't. Yes. You get into those projects. Well, first of all, you have to test. And then on the homepage, when you get your results back, when you get your homepage back, go to uh, projects. And like I showed you where it gave suggestions on what projects to join for my uncle. Then you just click on projects and there'll be a, a, something that'll pop up for you. And you, your first project that you want to join is your haplogroup project. So like my uncle, uh, for example, is the IM223. That was his first designation when we tested. And I put him into that. You know, that was our first. And then we kind of go from there. But it really depends on what your Y DNA shows you it will guide you to the new, next project. You can do surname projects. Now, my uncle's um, surname is Ross. And unfortunately, there are about five to seven different lines of Ross that I've identified. So, but why DNA is kind of putting those groups together slow, but sure. So, you know, that's kind of what you have to do. It's a slow growing process with the Y DNA. Uh, usually now they're having um, uh, sales on the Y DNA. Um, I don't know how long they're gonna last. They may have another one around Christmas time. Um, usually this is their big push, you know, Black Friday and all of that. So almost all the DNA companies are doing specials right now. Okay, any other questions? So on, yes. on family on family tree DNA, there's like four different kinds of tests. So what, what I was trying to ask earlier is which of their tests would would you recommend? Like if your if your primary interest is 
the, the the information about historical events and your family tree is that just the family ancestry test is that that's, good stuff that's you need yeah. to do the why or the minor campus? okay uh let me i'll, I'll kind of clarify that because that's a very good question your Y DNA is going to take you back as far as your Y DNA where it started. It had you, or if you're really lucky, you might have somebody with the same surname. But I can tell you from managing five tests now, the matching surnames don't really exist unless you're, you know, having a father son, and then you're going to see it. So you have to kind of look beyond that and understand the history of that surnames didn't really come into existence till about late 1500s, maybe mid 1500s. So they went by unique names, depending on where they lived, what they did. So surnames weren't necessarily used as a, a, a identifying marker. So you can see from the Y DNA test that I did with my uncle that I shared with you, it went back to about 500 CE, which is before surnames. So I've got to wait till somebody tests and does the Y700 to see if my uncle and, and that match put together that same identification. Then I can contact that person. That's one thing I like about Family Tree DNA, does give you an email. So it's easy to contact that person. You can contact that person and say, hey, it looks like we have a good Y DNA match. What is the uh, oldest male relative that you have on that, that kit? So that's how you kind of build your tree based on that. So mitochondrial, let me tell you a real quick story. I think I have time. So as I told you, I was adopted and I decided I wanted to test everything possible on my DNA. Didn't know where it was going to lead me. So I went to Family Tree DNA and I tested the mitochondrial. I did the full test and it gave me H1A1B. All right. So what does that mean? I didn't know. So I had one match that was like one genetic difference. And she was the closest I'd ever had. So I reached out and I said, it looks like we might share a common mother, a grandmother at some point in time. Would you like to, you know, work on this? She wrote back and said, yes. So we communicated um, for off and on for about a month. We really were not connecting through our trees. Um, she had different names that I was not familiar with. Eventually, we did find the, the person that we connected with after we worked together for about two months. But now we had to prove it. So was our ideas correct? So what we did is we built an autosomal test. This was a fourth great grandmother that we believed that we shared in common. So I tested my mom. She tested about four female cousins that came from this same line, or at least we suppose that they did. Guess what? Everybody shared DNA with my mom in the amount of a third to fourth cousin. So with autosomal and with the mitochondrial DNA test, we were able to prove our fourth great grandmother. Now. I could leave it at that, but that would be no fun. I love to find cousins. So we made arrangements for me to come up and meet my cousins who happened to live in Rochester, Minnesota. They got a whole bunch of people there. They were gonna have a family celebration. So they invited me to participate. I did some research at the Genealogical Society and I kept finding this priest's name that he was from another county, like about an hour away, said something to my cousin. And she says, oh yeah, we ought to go over there. So we drove over about an hour drive, went to the basement of their genealogical society. And I said, I'm looking for a potential baptismal marriage death record from this church. And I, I gave him the information. 
within one minute, he came back with the original marriage certificate of my third great grandparents that nobody even knew about. So I could share that with my mom. That is what DNA and research is all about, being able to share your family with others. So any other questions? Do you have handouts online? It is online. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Yes. Okay, you had mentioned how cancer treatment affects DNA. Yes. Is it a significant? Yes. Life? It depends. If you think about it in this manner, there's all kinds of treatments for cancer, but the one I'm most familiar with is a blood cancer. They literally destroy all of your white blood cells and they inject someone else's stem cells, white blood, blood, blood back into you. So your bone marrow starts producing the new. So yes, it is different. Is that MDS? Myelodial plastic syndrome. There's several. Um, the one I was most familiar with is ALL. But if you think about another cancer treatment, you know, radiation, uh, you know, that affects your DNA at a lighter degree. But if you're dealing with cancer, they're getting a lot of radiation on their x rays. But I definitely would wait several years before doing DNA for anyone that's underwent a cancer treatment and be expecting not to have 100%. Yes. Well, then, is your original DNA return after five years? Is that what you're No, it just gets healthier. And you would be able to use some of it for DNA research, is really what I'm saying. But it depends on the type of cancer that you're being treated for, how soon your body recovers. Yeah. Any other questions? Which session this afternoon is ancestry? Off the top of my head, I think it's the one right after lunch. Uh, well, we can pull up the calendar too. Uh, it's here is ancestry DNA. Yeah, it's at oh, one yeah. o'clock. It's at one o'clock. Thank you. And it gets easier. This is the hardest one. I wanted to get it out of the way. <laughs> it's under the library. Yes. Yeah. Now I will tell you, um, if you're local and even if you're just in state, um, there's the Topeka Geological Society. Um, we offered about three, four years of DNA classes for free. Um, I took a, a year off this year, um, but I'll probably go back to uh, teaching on a more easy basis to try to absorb the information because it's a, it's really easier to do as a class that you come to over and over again to develop the skills. Um, what I threw at you is just about everything Family Tree DNA has to offer. But I also want to leave you hope because any question you have, Google it. There are hundreds of videos out there, hundreds of companies that are willing to teach you about DNA and any type of DNA. So don't just explore. It's there for you. Webinars, YouTube videos. You go into you, you like YouTube and then type DNA. You'll find unique people that you like to listen to. Um, and so you start following them. Okay, any questions? All right, thank you for coming. Thank you.